So I'm going to surprise you this morning. I'm going to show you how we can have more fish in the sea, more seafood on our plate, and more prosperous communities. And even more surprising, it'll be the fishermen that lead this effort. The people who catch the fish are actually the key to saving the fish. Why do I have the confidence to make this statement? Environmentalists don't normally make positive predictions about the future. We all generally agree that we're going to hell in a handbasket, and we just argue over the details. How hot will it be? And what sort of handbasket will we be traveling in? The ocean story is often told along similar lines. Once we had almost unimaginable abundance. When European settlers first went to the US, they veered between boasts and complaints about the number of fish in the water, it made passage difficult. They were the size of grown men. You could just dip a bucket in and scoop them out. This was back when we believed natural resources to be infinite, and we treated it as such. But this famous abundance just as famously collapsed from sea to shining sea. Starting with the cod in the Northeast in the 1990s, and then moving down to the Gulf of Mexico, the red snapper, and then salmon in California. In many cases, we ended up with less than 3% of recorded levels. The regulations that were put in place, doing things like uh, restricting gear and putting shorter and shorter seasons into place, simply increased desperation without helping the fish. Fishermen, in an attempt to get as many fish in those shortened seasons, fished harder and faster during those specified times. Bycatch was rampant. Fishing jobs went out the door. And still, fish stocks continued to plummet. But in some cases, this story has a different ending. But before we get to that, let's talk about what overfishing is and why it matters. Overfishing is simply taking fish out of the water faster than they can reproduce. It's not an inevitable state of affairs due to use. <clears throat> this is something that we know that we have an opportunity to change. And it's not something that just it's not a matter of just you and I looking at a menu and not being able to have the fish option. There are over 3 billion people who depend on fish as their main source of protein. And fishermen are 38 million strong. So this is really important. We've seen also how the loss of fishing jobs off the coast of Somalia can lead to piracy. So getting it right really is important, and it's also possible. Let me introduce you to Buddy Gwendon. Buddy is a second-generation red snapper fisherman in the Gulf of Mexico. He's been fishing for almost 40 years, almost his whole adult life. When the stocks crashed, regulators came in and cut the days on the water by about, by about 80 percent in an attempt to save the remaining fish. Buddy and his mates began a race to the bottom. He told me how he had to spend every last minute fixing his gear, fixing his boats, fixing his nets to make sure that during those few days, that he was able to go out there, that he could catch the fish he needed to make the money. 
that he needed to support his family. But what happened was that he just couldn't, he, he couldn't get it done in those periods of time. He saw his friends get out of, uh, his uh, jobs got lost, he saw friends get hurt, they lost their gear. <clears throat> and things got worse and worse. Then, in 2007, Buddy heard about a program from the Environmental Defense Fund, something new. He hated it. And when it came to a vote, he voted against it. But it passed anyway, and so he had to adapt. What he found was that almost immediately, he started making more money. And he had more time to do what he loved. Now, Buddy's whole family is part of his successful fishing business. His brother, Kenny, and his son, Hans, run his commercial boats. And another son, uh, runs, uh, Nick, runs his uh, successful fish house. Katie's fish house, named after his wife. Katie's only complaint about this problem, about this program, is that sometimes she sees Buddy a little bit too much now. <laughs> so what is the system that allows both fish and fishermen to thrive? It's rights-based management, sometimes called cat shares in the US. Scientists set a total allowable catch for a fishery. And then a percentage of that catch is distributed to fishermen and to communities. Shares can be bought and sold. And as the value of a fishery grows, so do the value of the shares. It allows fishermen to choose when and where they go out on the water. So they're no longer fishing in storms or in dangerous conditions. And subsidies, once a major part of fishing communities, can be reduced. In the US, about 65% of fisheries, of fish caught in federal waters, are under a catch share. But if that number got to 100%, we could take a billion dollars off the deficit. The results in the Gulf really speak for themselves. Not only have we seen a 90% drop in bycatch, that's uh, throwing dead fish back into the water that you didn't want, but we've also seen a 120% increase in the catch and a 72% increase in revenues. And this is not a one-off result. A study of US and Canadian cat shares so shows an average revenue increase of about 68%, and a threefold increase in safety. Also, compliance is nearly 100% because the fishermen see how the system helps them. If you locate a marine protected area near a cat share system, the fishermen help to maintain the protected area. They actually become the protectors. And that's why I say that when these systems are better known, the fishermen will actually become the champions of conservation. A survey of over 11,000 fisheries in the world found that they had one thing in common if they were healthy some form of rights-based management. And that could be a traditional area-based management like TERFs in Chile, or it could be complex IFQs in Denmark or cat shares in California. But they all had some form of rights-based management, and that's important. Now that we have revised common fisheries policy rules here in the EU, 
the potential is tremendous. If we get the systems designed right, and this is the tricky part, it's really hard to design them. But if we get the design right, preliminary science shows that not only can we double the amount of fish swimming in the ocean, but we could triple the value of the fisheries while still providing more seafood for people to eat. Here in Sweden, local artisanal fisherman Peter Olsen is working with EDF as well. When he first heard about this system, like most fishermen, he felt it wasn't for him. He was worried that because he's a small fisherman that he'd get squeezed out. But after going on a learning exchange to British Columbia and talking with fishermen who'd actually gone through the process, he decided that this was the right thing to do. I asked him a couple days ago, why are you spending so much time working with other fishermen, trying to get other fishermen and the government agencies together on this? And he said to me, if we want sustainable fisheries and a good life for me, this is the only way. It gives me hope, but it's the only way. This food revolution that you're talking about here is gathering strength. More and more people are asking about the origin and the impact of the food on their plates. It's time that we realize that fishermen hold the key to abundant oceans, that NGOs and governments need to empower them to design these rights and to make them more accountable for their catch. We really can have not just a win-win, but a, a, the rare triple, triple win, win-win-win. We can have more fish in the sea, more seafood on our plate, and more prosperous communities. And I think that's worth fighting for. Thank you.